really understanding what you're trying to do as a business, as many functions of what they're working on, what's on their roadmap, and ultimately how is that translating into the pricing and that story that you're trying to communicate to your customers through your sales team. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the fluid relationship between them. I'm Mark Siving. Today, our guest is Chris Barth. And here are three things you want to know about Chris before we start. He is currently VP of Pricing at Pitney Bowes Commerce Services. He was a VP of Finance Operations at Nugistics, who was acquired by Pitney Bowes. And I love finance people who get into pricing. And as a hobby, he likes to travel internationally. And he's been to a couple of places I'm really jealous of. He's been to Galapagos and Greenland. Welcome, Chris. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for having me today. I'm, I'm excited to be here with you. That's going to be a lot of fun. So how did you get into pricing in the first place? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. And to be honest with you, I kind of stumbled into pricing. Um, you know, I have a finance undergrad degree from the University of Texas. And coming out of, of school in the mid-90s, you know, I really thought I was going to take a traditional FP&A role you know, budgeting, forecasting. That's kind of what I was trained to do. Um, That's where my mind was at. I was looking at some opportunities out of college and one of them was kind of a consulting, a finance consulting role. Uh, And another one was a, an opportunity to work at Dell in Round Rock. So I think most, most of your listeners would know who Dell is and that fabulous story uh, here in, in central Texas. So it was a tough choice. Uh, actually, the consulting role was going to pay more, but in the end, I decided to uh, take this job with Dell. I came on as a, as a temporary employee, and I worked in special pricing there at Dell for uh, roughly about a year as a temp, and I worked in different segments there. I started out in the uh, what they called the, the education, state, and local government segment, which was uh, you know pricing computers and services for K-12, higher ed, and state and local government. And then as the, uh, the buying seasons kind of shifted, I moved over into the federal government in the third quarter that year, went over to enterprise accounts, and then ultimately ended up uh, in the large corporate accounts segment uh, where I was hired on full-time, and I spent another year and a half there. So all told, about two and a half years uh, at Dell to start my career in the late 90s, which was a great time to be there. Uh, yeah, and so you were growth. doing... You were doing pricing on big deals at Dell. Is that a good way to say it? That, that's correct, Mark. So r- really special nice, price. Nice. Okay. Right. By special meaning non-standard. Exactly. So th- this would be bundled pricing. This would be larger deals. Um, uh, when you think about federal governments or higher ed institutions that are buying a number of computers or or servers or laptops, uh, they're looking for a bundled price. So they're obviously wanting a better deal than what you or I could, could go and secure buying one or two computers you know, yeah, for ourselves. De- definitely. Okay, so here we are <clears throat> 25 years later. How did you become a VP of pricing? What, what skills, what, uh, what, did you, what were you able to do to get to that status? Well, it, you know, I tell you, I started out at Dell and it, it was kind of a blessing. It, you know, you think about pricing as a, as a business function in companies, and it wasn't a huge focus, I would say, in the 90s like it is today. It's getting much more recognition in companies uh, as, as just a key component to profitability in companies. Um, so I kind of stumbled into it, like I said, and I really enjoyed it. So what I loved about pricing both at Dell and through the rest of the companies that I worked for in my career is just, you're in the middle of the action, right? You, you have your fingers on the pulse of the business. You, you have to know so much about what's going on with companies. Um, You have to know what they're trying to do, their business strategies, your understanding competitors, what the, um, you know, what the sales folks are saying, what the customers are saying, what product marketing, you really get immersed in, in terms of, of what's going on in the market. Whereas in a traditional finance or in an accounting role, 
it, it's much more localized, if you will, in terms of doing your function, a lot of repetitive things around closing books, forecasting, but not so much having your fingers on the pulse of what's going on in the market, which is really exciting because you, you know, companies never stand still, right? The market never stands still or not very long. And so you, you want to know what's happening. Who's, who are the entrants? Uh, are folks going out of business? What are the customers asking for? Um, you know, what are the pain points? How are you evolving as a company? What's happening in, in the market, et cetera. And so it just really became interesting to me. I, I quickly lost my interest in, in just kind of a traditional FP&A role and wanted to pursue that path. And I loved working in pricing because of the impact it can have on profitability in companies. And so I've just, I, I've had some FP&A in my career, but the majority of it, I always come back to pricing. I just have a, a passion and a love for it. So, so I absolutely love that answer. And it made me want to ask you about 20 other questions. But the one question that's, that's highest in mind is, People, in, people who aren't in pricing often think that pricing is about this one lever that we have to pull, right? Am I going to lower my price? Am I going to raise my price? But when you're in trying to manage deals or close deals and you only have this one lever, which is price, what you're really trying to do is look at all of the other levers out there and saying, can we really hold our price, right? What can we do to not have to lower this one price? Does that seem like a reasonable way to describe this? Yeah, in some ways. I mean, there's, you know, you're always thinking about, you know, how can I hold the line on price? But there are some situations where, you know, if you can peel back um, what I'll call, you know, certain features of your product or your service um, to offset the price trade off, where a customer is not going to get the full value that somebody's paying for a premium service or a premium product. That's one avenue that you can take. Um, but it's really trying to match. What are the needs of the customers with the solution that you're offering and what is the appropriate price? I mean, it, th that's the key is trying to match up the value, what the customer is looking for, you know, who you're competing with and trying to figure out, um, you know, what do I do with the price here? Right. And there's not a, there's never a one size fits all. Everybody's different. The needs are different, who you're competing with, the situation, the size of the customer, um, you know, who's the incumbent, you know, where do you stand in the marketplace, right? Which is, are, are you, are, are you somebody that has a great reputation? Are you a premium brand? Are you a new brand? And it's all those dynamics. There's 50,000 ways you've got to think about <laughs> how do I set the price and what is the appropriate price? And sometimes you just have to say, no, that's okay. I think a lot of folks, particularly in sales, um, it, it can't be everything to everybody. And sometimes you have to say no. Sometimes a customer just doesn't fit what you're trying to do as a business, and that's okay. Uh, absolutely. I love the fact that you use the word value and we're trying to find the appropriate price. And one of the questions that I, I really want to ask you, because you come from a finance background, is do you remember when you made a mental switch from cost plus pricing or thinking that pricing is based on costs to thinking about pricing is based in value? Yeah, that's, that's a really great point, Mark. And so <laughs> that kind of comes back to my career uh, trajectory. So I'll, I'll talk about where I started at Dell and then how I sort of evolved my thinking and when, when that actually changed, because it's a great point. Um, when you first get out, so, you know, when I started out at Dell, I was young. I was 21 years old, 22 years old, very young. Um, didn't know a whole lot about pricing or the field of it. And at that time in Dell, we're talking about 1997, 1998, 1999, um, they had a cost advantage over everybody, okay? If you've ever read the book or the story, go get it. There's a, there's a book published by Michael Dell out there that talks about that business model, um, you know, the just-in-time inventory of the vendors across the street, super interesting. I'm not going to get into it, but long story short is that was easy pricing for me at the time. We could win all day long because we had a cost advantage. So I didn't really, there was some talk about competitors and who we're competing against and you're thinking about volume and those types of things. But at the end of the day, Dell had a cost advantage when I was there and it was very easy to win business. So you didn't have to think about so much of, you know, how do I, how do I differentiate? How do I position my value? That was less of a conversation. So it was interesting to me there, but it wasn't the way that, 
you really should think about it. And I didn't pivot my thinking until a little bit later on when I got to logistics in a startup mode. So I went from Dell, I spent a few years in telecom, um, but really where my, my, my thinking shifted was when I started up at Nugistics um, in 2003. And here was a uh, really a startup company, not quite incubation stage, but this was a company that was shifting their business model, okay? They were rethinking how they did business, how they went to market. And at the time that I had joined in March of 2003, they had, I wanna say it was less than 10 customers. One of them was actually one of the investors. Um, so that was kind of easy. They're one of your customers. Um, but we had to think about, okay, how do, we, how do we go to market? How do we sell? How do we position value? Because we don't have a cost advantage. We're in a, a logistics industry trying to solve um, a return solution, pioneering a new solution, something that, that somebody hadn't really thought about coming out of the dot-com boom. How do you get returns back to customers? And it wasn't a big focus of anybody, really. And when I say anybody, our competitors would have been somebody else that could have handled the package, UPS, a FedEx, a DHL, a USPS. They were all focused on deliveries and getting products out. No one had solved the issue of, hey, this shirt doesn't fit or I just don't like it. I bought it online. How do I get it back? And so we had to really think about we didn't have this, this grand network. We didn't have assets. And here we had to sell value and convince retailers to pay for our solution. And then in turn, we had to coach our customers on how to position it with their consumers. And so we had to think about the entire chain of how do we sell this solution? And it's, it was just a great, a great point in my career of, of learning how to pivot our thinking and how to justify the price that you're charging, thinking about all these value components. I especially like the fact that you not only had to convince your customers that you were adding value, but help teach them how to communicate that value to their customers, right? So it's like a, uh, it's like a double layer of value. Exactly. Which, which is not uncommon in a lot of places where we're trying to get our customers to do something new and different. They need to see the light with their customers as well. Exactly. So, Pretty interesting. So one of the things we talked about uh, real briefly before we started recording was managing or working with salespeople. And at, at Dell, you worked on big deals and at Nugistics, you've been dealing with big deals and big customers. And I assume that's true at Pitney Bowes as well. So what do you think are the, what are, what are the challenges with getting salespeople to sell value? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Mark. And it's, uh, you know, there, there's always some good salespeople, right, that, that have the experience, that know how to do it. Um, and, and then there's others that are, are going to sell on price, right? And that's the easiest path or the, the path of least resistance, I would say. So, you know, one of the things that you got to think about is, first of all, there's got to be good training that, that typically comes from the product teams, it comes from sales leadership. Um, but all the things that go into um, what you're trying to do as a business have got to translate into your positioning in the market and what you're trying to do. So when I say that, it's, it's just understanding your business strategy. And, and that's, there's a number of components that go into that from, from leadership um, all the way down to product marketing, et cetera. So you, you can't be everything to everybody. That's a very very difficult um, <laughs> business model. I know that uh, sales folks, given the opportunity, uh, they probably would sell anything to anybody if they could make a commission and it's gonna pay the money. That's, that's how they make a living. So you have to understand their point of view and, and how you bring sales folks into the fold of, of selling value, okay? And, and selling at price points that make sense in the market. Okay, and how you do that is you've got, first of all, you've got to understand the market very well. That's key. So if you don't understand where you're winning and losing in the market, it's hard to understand those data points on how to guide the sales team on, on where and how they should sell and then how to tie that into commission plans. Yeah, let me, let me jump back for just a second. Um, one of the things you talked about were 
the product teams teaching sales about value. Now, my experience is a lot of product teams don't even know the value of their products. And, and I'm not trying to ask you to point fingers at them or anything like that, but I find that really challenging to get product people to understand value. And they're not even out in front of the customers. Yeah, I think it's a good point. And I've had different experiences, to be honest with you, with uh, different product teams. Um, some, some really do. And they, they understand how they're trying to position their product in the market, who they're competing with, what they're trying to be. Um, that's, to me, that's a really good product manager. And you have others who are, uh, you know, I've worked with some that are, are coming up with a product, don't really know if the customers are interested in it. And they're trying to put something out there and, and seeing if it sticks and they have a hard time articulating, you know, what is the value of this? So why would a customer want to buy this? And the way I always think about it, when you're trying to set value and think of put yourself in the customer's shoes, right? Would Absolutely. you buy this product? Would you, would you pay for the solution? What need or problem are you trying to solve in the market? And what is it worth? I mean, that's how you've got to think about it from a customer's perspective. And if you can't convince yourself that, that you would want to buy this or it's solving a need and it's worth some type of money, but then you have to dollarize that ultimately, that value into a price is how you got to think about it. Then you're probably not going to be very successful. So if you're not thinking about, okay, can a customer do this on their own? Can they buy it from somebody else? And, you know, who am I competing with? What's out there? If you don't know the answers to all that, you're going to have a hard time articulating value and ultimately translating that to price. Yeah, I think that was an absolutely brilliant answer. I love the idea of putting yourself in the customer's shoes and saying, hey, would I buy this, right? What are the problems I'm solving? Let's assume then that we actually do have product people that understand value. We are able to teach salespeople what value is and means, and, and let's assume they even understand it. We also know that price is a lever that salespeople have, and it's an easy lever to pull. Right? It's, it's sometimes easier to say, I'm going to sell, I'll give you a discount rather than trying to convince somebody why they should pay us the price we should get. And so you briefly brought up commissions. Is there a way that we can structure our commission plans to, to give salespeople the authority they need to discount when they need to, but give them the incentive to not discount unless they absolutely need to? Yeah, it's, it's a great point. And it's, I think, for a lot of folks that are in pricing, I, I think it's sort of a miss sometimes in the role. So if you think about um, anybody that's in a pricing role, dealing in a, in a relationship type sale, uh, B2B, where you're working with sales teams and really sales is selling. So th this isn't you just putting a product on a website and a price and a promo and a customer making a decision. This is relationship sales um, sales folks, they get paid on commission. So, and, and you're right. So the path of least resistance is often to lower the price. So how do you guard against that? Right. Um, you, you know, we've all heard sales folks say, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm getting a 10% commission, 10% of no sales, nothing. Right. So that's how they earn a living. And if they have to drop the price and there's no consequences to it, or there's, there's really no incentive to try to sell value. Um, it, you're, you're going to get into a situation where you've got potentially some profit leak, right? And then it's going to come down to, uh, do you have a good salesperson or not? And are they, are they tending to, to rely on price as a crutch to sell, or are they trying to sell value? So how do you, how do you put some, some guardrails in place, um, you know, to, to drive the kind of behavior that you want with a sales team? Um, I'll tell you one of the things that, that we did, I won't talk about it in detail, but we took a look at, at the sales commission plan, how it was structured. And there's different ways to do it, different organizations. Um, a, lot of, a lot of sales comp plans are set either by like a sales ops team or the sales team themselves in conjunction with HR. And I think a, a miss is, is not engaging pricing or having pricing have some say in that. Pricing should know the market. They should know where you're winning and losing what's going to work, how does that value articulate, and then be able to segment up your business into um, appropriate price points that are typical for selling. And what you want to do is you want to reward sales folks 
who sell at or above what's happening in the market. And you wanna pay them handsomely. So one of the things that we did is we took a look at the comp plans. First of all, we widened the commission band. Okay, so it was very narrow before, it was a half point to say three points. And what you wanna do is, is take a look at that. Um, salespeople, really good ones that are selling value and selling at or above the market should be some of your highest paid folks in the company. They are driving your business. And that is extremely profitable business that allows you uh, to both grow, fuel investments, uh, continue to do what you're doing as a company. But if you're always selling on price, you're leaving money on the table. And it doesn't mean that you, you won't necessarily take that deal, but why should you pay a salesperson a lot of money to sell strictly on price? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, it, you, know, you don't need a highly paid salesperson to come in and just continue to flow to price until they want a deal. That's not really selling in my mind. It, it doesn't take a ton of skill to do that. What you want are sales folks really being, being able to articulate the value, matching that value to a customer's needs, and being able to capture the highest possible price that can tied to the value and optimizing your profit as a company. Yeah, so one of the tricks that I've always uh, recommended, tried, used is, if the pricing team is able to calculate a target price and that target price is based on, you know, what region is the customer in? How big is the customer? What do we think that customer should be paying us? If we had the ability to say, this is a target price, then any salesperson who sold above that price gets a nice commission rate. Any salesperson who sells below that price gets a much lower commission rate. Is that what you're thinking or something like that? Or there's some other tweaks to that we could make? Yeah, it, exactly. That, that's exactly how we thought about it, Mark. So we had the data um, by product, by market, by size of customer. We had everything segmented out. So we knew uh, basically where the sweet spot was for selling. So, and, and what we did is when we transformed the commission plan, we said, okay, if sales folks are selling at the sweet spot, let's make sure they're making about the same as they were before, right? We didn't want to upset the apple cart and introduce some commission plan that all of a sudden they're selling what, what they've always been selling and now they're making less or, or worse, making a heck of a lot more. So you wanted to keep that even. And what we did is uh, we came up with an algorithm that was kind of an exponential algorithm. So as you continued up and sold a higher price and worked harder to sell value, you made a lot more. And same thing as you sold below what was happening in the market, you made a lot less. Um, so it wasn't linear. And for every change in discount, there was, a, there was an offsetting change in commission. So a lot of commission plans, they just have these bands, which is, hey, if you sell in this range 10 to 15%, um, you get X percent. Well, what's gonna happen? The sales folks are, you know, some of them will sell, you know, higher than the, than the 10 to 15, but you know, why would you sell anything higher than the 10? You're just gonna drop down to the bottom if you can. Um, so it just doesn't make any sense. So you want to correlate every change in price, even subtle changes to some movement in the commission plan so that, you know, there's a quarter point or a tenth of a point of commission, all that adds up in terms of really fine tuning, matching the price point to what the customer is willing to pay and matching that exactly with the commission payout that you want to give to the salesperson. I think that's absolutely a, a brilliant way to think about this. Um, if you're ever willing to share that math with me, I'd love to see it just to see what you guys did. Uh, it's totally sure. okay if it's proprietary. Um, did you ever read the book Freakonomics? Because probably my favorite story that I've told way too many times out of Freakonomics was realtors selling houses. And the I, fact that, oh, you have to go read this if you haven't seen I, it. I, I haven't read it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question now, but now you've got me curious. So go ahead. Oh, but the best part of this is, is uh, they did a, a research study on realtors and how long a house was on the market for and what their average discount was. And then they compared that to the exact same realtors when they were selling their own house. And the difference is when you're selling your own house, all of a sudden I'm making a much, much, I get to keep a much bigger chunk. And so that sure. commission really matters and just play, paying a straight percentage on revenue just doesn't incentivize salespeople to, to behave in the best way possible for the customer. Right. 
So absolutely love that story. Chris, this has just been a fantastic conversation. Uh, but we have to wrap it up. And let me ask the final question. What's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? You know, I think uh, when I think about, you know, what makes somebody really successful in pricing uh, or what makes a successful pricer, it's, it, to me, it's, it's really getting engaged and involved in everything that's going on in your company. So to me, um, successful pricing folks uh, are some of the most knowledgeable folks in a company. And I say that because you have to know really what everybody's working on in terms of you're the, you're the person or, or, or you're the, the group that is translating what everybody in a company is working on into the value and the price. And you have to understand how you're positioned, right, in the market. Mm -hmm. And what is everybody working on? What is product working on? What is the IT group working on in terms of data? Uh, what is accounting? How, do the, how does the, the billing look? Are the customers happy with it? Do they understand their bills? Um, the marketing side of it. Um, so every, every piece of the business, operations, IT, accounting, billing, you gotta understand, you know, is it good, is it bad? How does it compare to what everybody else is doing in terms of your competitors? And are you better or worse? Because when you understand that, you can then translate that into value. You can understand, uh, you know, should I be pricing it about what my competitors are because we're, uh, uh, you know, we're on equal footing, if you will. Are we doing something better that's driving more value that's in demand? Therefore, we should charge a premium. Or are we trying to break into a market? Our services are bad. We're not there yet. And therefore, I'm not going to be able to command a price that my competitors are. And you're going to have to be a little bit cheaper if you're going to overcome that, that value hurdle. So really understanding what you're trying to do as a business, as many functions of what they're working on, what's on their roadmap, and ultimately, how is that translating into the pricing and that story that you're trying to communicate to your customers through your sales team? That was an absolutely fantastic answer, Chris. And I actually have a corollary that I'll share with you. And the corollary is everybody in your company either creates or destroys value. I agree with that 100%. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, Mark. It's sad, but it's true. Absolutely. Episode number 112, all done. Um, so to our listeners, oh, I forgot, Chris, thank you for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn under uh, Christopher Barth. That's my full first name or my personal email address is faster call, just like it sounds, F-A-S-T-E-R call at gmail.com. Excellent. Now episode 112 is all done. Uh, to our listeners, would you please leave us a review? They're very, very helpful. And uh, if you know other pricing product people, tell a friend. Uh, I would be very grateful. Finally, if you have any questions or comments about this podcast or about pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.